welcome to this session on maritime security. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Olga Lupera, who is myself, so I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, underwater treat recognition and how to fine tune a convolutional network, network model uh, with pertain from very high resolution synthetic aperture sonar images and how to apply it to lower resolution sonar data. So I'm going to ask uh, now the technical support to uh, play my presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or well, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on which part of the, of the planet you are now. My name is uh, Olga Lopera. I'm a research scientist uh, at the Royal Military Academy in Brussels, and today I want to talk about uh, underwater trade recognition um, and uh, how to fine tune a uh, convolutional network model in order to work with sonar data from different acoustic sensors. So this topic is in the, in the context of uh, mind control measures. So let me just introduce quickly for the ones of you that are not familiar with this topic. So what we are working here is we try to detect and classify uh, bottom targets or targets that are um, deployed in the water column. Uh, the kind of targets we are looking for are small targets, so the dimensions are really from one meter and a half uh, length uh, until uh, 50 centimeters diameter more or less. So these are kind of small targets. Uh, and that, as, as I mentioned, it can be deployed in different locations in the water column or at the bottom of the sea. But here we are going to focus on the targets that are deployed at the bottom of the sea. And for this specific uh, uh, presentation, for this specific study, uh, I'm going just to focus on three of those uh, targets, which are the cylindrical one, the truncated cone, or Manta, it's called Manta, this kind of mine, and also the wedge uh, shape or broken uh, mine. So, uh, to give you an idea of how challenging uh, this is, here you can see uh, an image of more or less 200 meters, uh, an acoustic image at the bottom of the sea where we can, where we can see at, uh, a wreck. Uh, this wreck is more or less 50 meters in length, and at the bottom of the image, at the left side, there is a small object there in the corner. Well, this is more or less the dimensions of the object that we are trying to look for, to detect and classify. This image has been collected using a synthetic aperture sonar working at 300 kilohertz. So what do we search on those, uh, those images? is, well, um, characteristics like a highlight followed by a shadow. Uh, for instance, uh, when human operators are working with acoustic data, this is the kind of information that the human brain is searching for. It's a highlight followed by a shadow. And here it's important to mention that depending on the, on the angle of view and the range uh, that uh, we are uh, isolifying the object, the sonar, we will have a different image for the same object. No? So if we are uh, positioned in different uh, angles, different ranges, the highlight and the shadow uh, can be totally different for the same object. So uh, more and more, uh, the micro temperatures community is going not to work with uh, human operators, but more and more with automatic target recognition algorithms. Here we are going to uh, talk about uh, convolutional neural networks. So the idea is that we have uh, a network which is composed uh, from convolutional layers and cooling layers, and uh, some also dense layers, and, and at the end, an output. So for this particular uh, uh, case study, we have used a convolutional network that has been developed in the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation of uh, NATO 
in La Spezia. And is, this uh, architecture is composed by uh, four convolutional blocks. Each of these blocks has a specific number of convolutional layers, and each of them contains uh, four square filters. It, it also, uh, each convolutional block is followed by a pudding label. So here at the bottom, you can see the boxes, uh, the name of the boxes C and P. C uh, corresponds to the convolutional blocks and P to the pudding layers. So each convolutional block is followed by one pudding layer. And also we have at the end uh, one tens layer, which contains four nodes. So the, the design of this architecture uh, has the characteristic that this dense layer contains only four nodes, which means that uh, it's only four features that we are using in order to classify the targets. So the input is a, a synthetic aperture sonar uh, image, the magnitude of the image, and the output is a scalar prediction of, uh, of a class member chip. Okay, this is for the uh, scene that we are using. This uh, network has been trained data from the muscle. The muscle is a, a specific aperture sonar um, from the CMRE, the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation. They have collected several uh, data sets from several years at different locations. And from those data sets, they have used more or less 70% of the data to train those uh, uh, network, this network, and 30% uh, of the data to test it. So they have uh, a very uh, diverse, uh, in terms, diverse data set in terms of number of uh, types of targets and also C buttons, type of C buttons, as you can see here in this uh, slide. So now let, let's move, let's move to uh, our data set that we are going to, uh, to use to fine tune and to test this convolutional neural network. So, here we are talking of data that has been collected during different uh, trials and, and C campaigns uh, since 2016 until last year. These campaigns have been uh, carried out in the Belgian part of the North Sea and we have been. Uh, collecting data with different systems, synthetic aperture sonar, as well as side scan sonar. This is a very particular area uh, in front of Austin, more or less uh, 30 kilometers from the coast. Um, it's more or less uh, four nautical ma square miles. And it's in an area that is uh, very shallow water, so the water column is uh, between 20 and 35 meters deep, and it is characterized by a very strong current because of the uh, tidal uh, difference that is present is, uh, here in the North Sea. So we have different types of sea flows as well. Uh, fine coarse sand, which is really flat. Uh, we have also the presence of sand ripples in this area. Uh, sand ripples from 20 to 30 centimeters high, or it can be smaller sand ripples, less than 50 centimeters high. We can also observe that there are lots of uh, trolling uh, marks. These are not uh, natural marks, they are uh, caused by uh, fishery, so by uh, human uh, impact in, uh, work in the area. So this is the kind of uh, environment that we are uh, confronted to. In this area, as I mentioned before, there, there have been uh, several uh, sea trials and, and tests where we have uh, deployed different kinds of targets, uh, including also uh, friendly objects, not only uh, mines. And the, the, these systems have covered uh, not always the same uh, area and not always the same uh, type of target. So there is a difference between different uh, data from one sensor to the other. 
So we don't have exactly the same data set from all different uh, sensors. This is already something uh, challenging our experiment. Um, now, uh, the data, we decided to uh, evaluate it for this uh, specific uh, topic we are talking today. Uh, we decided to divide it by resolution. So, uh, in order not to make a comparison between different sonars or different systems, we uh, just divided the data by resolution. We are uh, divided in data set 1, data set 2, and data set 3. Data set 1 is, is high resolution from 3 to 5 centimeters. Data set 2 is uh, medium resolution from 5 to 10 centimeters. And data set 3 is the rest, so higher than 10 centimeters resolution. You can see here a difference between low resolution and high resolution for the same uh, target. So uh, the difference is uh, the higher resolution is on the right side of the slide. And you can see that there are there is much more information, visual information, visually, visually speaking, for the human uh, brain. There is more information uh, as the resolution increases, but it should see, which is a logical uh, expectation. So for the CNN that we are going to use, um, there was a kind of difference between the number of clutter that uh, is present in the data set of uh, CMRE and the number of targets uh, that uh, is present in uh, the data set they have. There is a kind of uh, a huge imbalance. Uh, there are more, so the, the minimum uh, data is the data of the targets, and there are more uh, data related to clutter. Um, in our case, well, this, this relation is the same. We have uh, more uh, data related to clutter than to, to the number of targets that we want to classify, and also smaller uh, amounts because uh, we are already working on it since 2016, and we have different, uh, we have performed those trials with different kinds of systems. So for the, um, the best resolution, the high resolution we have uh, is, the, is the data that we have the most number of, of clutter and number of targets as well. So uh, we first applied uh, the convolution and neural networks directly to the data without doing any uh, tuning of the architecture. And uh, we I, I show here uh, of classification in the function of the range. I divided uh, uh, by close range and far range in different uh, in groups of, uh, of uh, 50 meters, uh, sorry, 20 meters. And also I'm showing here the different uh, data sets by resolution. So the high resolution, middle resolution, and very low resolution. Uh, for the very low resolution, there is no data uh, from 110 meters on range because of the type of uh, sensor that was used to collect that data. Uh, the range doesn't go farther than 110 meters. Uh, then we can see here that the probability of detection uh, decreases with the, uh, sorry, the classification probability of classification decreases with the the resolution, which is a uh, logical expectation, since the uh, convolutional neural network has been trained with uh, very high resolution data. Uh, so, uh, here also we can see that uh, for the close range and the far range, the probability of classification is also very low, and this is uh, because of this particular environment here in the North Sea, we have uh, lots of currents, which makes that uh, the navigation is uh, very uh, stable with lots of errors. And this can be, this has an impact on the image, especially at, uh, at high ranges, um, where you can see here at the end, at the, at the right side of the of this uh, scientific aperture sonar image, you can see all the noise that is uh, coming movement of the platform because of the currents. 
now we also analyze the data uh, not only uh, by uh, range but also by type of target since the number of targets that we have the most is uh, symmetrical and truncated cones we are going just to focus on those two we are going to uh, discuss the uh, wage target because we didn't have enough to be representative for this kind of, uh, of graph so again i'm, I'm, I'm showing here the gravity of classification of those two targets depending on the range and uh, a very interesting observation is that uh, the truncated cone has a very complex uh, shape compared to the side cylinder that is uh, yeah, more simple shape has uh, more scores uh, higher than the cylinder the truncated cone and uh, this could be explained by the fact that uh, there is less, uh, yeah, there is, there is scarring uh, for the cylinder uh, that is causing to have extra, uh, info, extra, yeah, extra artifacts in the image. Now, uh, after uh, fine uh the CNN, well, first we decided to use only uh, the data set number one, so the higher resolution because of the number of uh, of uh, scene levels that we have uh, is the highest 50 between 130 and 150 I showed you already that we have these navigation errors so that uh, it's very difficult to to detect and, and classify some targets to, to this uh, noise that is added to the image at the end of the range at the, at the larger ranges okay so uh, some uh, further work that we are going to consider in the future. So, well, first, uh, this is a very challenging data set, as I was explaining, it's in shallow water, so we have the presence of multipath, which is affecting the image, the quality of the image, and of course, it's affecting the results as well from the, the classification results. We have also strong currents that uh, give some navigation errors, uh, navigation errors in the far ranges of the, of the image. So this is uh, already something to consider when we are going to um, yeah, develop new, new uh, approaches for uh, automatic target recognition for data that is collected here at NORC. So uh, for the future, we want to uh, consider different approaches to find the same. For instance, the use of isometries, that is something that is uh, recommended by the author of this uh, cognition and network. And we also want to try some data augmentation using uh, GANs. Um, we also have here uh, in the Belgian Navy, we have a very large uh, data from uh, data set from uh, Remus. And we want to use this database also to uh, fine tune uh, this, uh, this architecture, this, uh, this network. This uh, Remus is a dual frequency sensor, size can solo, and it's working from 900 to um, 1200 kilohertz. So it's really a uh, frequency range. Uh, it's also interesting uh, to see uh, how to analyze the results and the impact of this. But, but this uh, huge database that we still have, we have, we still need to do the curation and labeling that is going to take uh, quite a time but we hope by the uh, by the yeah by the second semester semester of this year to have some uh, some uh, results uh, on on the REMS data okay uh, this is the, uh, the end of my presentation uh, now thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions if any question arises Okay, so now we can uh, open the session for questions. If there are any questions from the presenters here in this uh, uh, Zoom um, application, so please you can raise your hand if you have some questions. Otherwise, I will uh, quickly check Imagina, but I see here from our support that uh, there are no questions on Imagina. So your, um, 
Irina or uh, Byron, do you have some questions? Then if not, then I suggest to pass to the next presentation. The next presentation is by Mrs. Irina Giorno. She's going to talk about the quality of acoustical equipment calibration for water site security, uh, historical mi mistakes, and international conflicts with the submarine C363. So uh, I can now ask to that technical support to play this presentation, please. Hello, my name is Irina Bjorna, and today I present a very interesting subject. It's a, a lecture about the quality of acoustical and radio equipment calibration for water site security, historical mistakes, and uh, international conflicts. Whiskey on the rock, submarine C363, uh, about new documents. And uh, this lecture, uh, this subject was inspired by me, my husband, uh, Professor Lai Bjorna, who started this conference. And when I just look at his archives, I saw some materials about the submarine and I started to make the investigation and I find out that now, after 40 years, a lot of new documents uh, came up, which I would like to present to you. What about these submarines? In 25th of October 1981, uh, 40 years ago, about approximately 40 years ago, Russian submarine C363 uh, start from uh, Svina Uschie, close to Gdynia. Uh, his uh, uh, pass to Bornholm, and then later they should uh, uh, go to St. Petersburg. What happens is that instead of uh, Bornholm, they came to Karlskrona. And uh, it happens uh, around uh, 27th of October. So on October 27th, uh, submarine uh, pop up in the south coast of Sweden, approximately 10 kilometers from Karlskrona, one of the largest Swedish naval bases. It means that mistake in the calculation when they are was about uh, hundreds uh, miles. And uh, yeah, I start to look at the documents which is uh, available now and I find out that uh, very interesting why the submarine make this mistake because it was a lot of speculation that maybe it's a russian navy was specially made this mistake to see how it is uh in the swedish naval base but um in fact fact is that it was very narrow pass about 12 meter and it's very inconvenient for the submarine and this submarine was uh laying in the bottom and couldn't couldn't uh, move because of the mistake so it was more mistaken uh, sluggishness sloppiness of the um, officer who should make the acoustical and radio recording of the uh, place where is submarine it, because in that period it was not navigation like a Google navigation or Earth navigation. So it was uh, based on the um, uh, not so sophisticated uh, equipment. But first uh, they saw submarine, it was a Swedish fisherman who was based that big submarine suddenly pop up in the Swedish water. And you can see here how, how submarine look like. It's a whiskey class, as they told that it's quite, quite big submarine. And uh, suddenly they find out themselves in Swedish water. So it was a lot of press and it was international scandal. And uh, I very pleased that it was not, uh, uh, it was decision about this uh, uh, incident was more political and more diplomatical and not so much uh, in the... I didn't know anything about this. In our uh, newspaper in Russia, it was nothing about this submarine in that time. I remember quite good because in that period I was in the uh, Moscow State University and um, 
so in such way that I was reading the newspapers, I didn't know anything about what happened. The submarine later on was uh, called uh, uh, Swedish Komsomolets <laughs> because of this incident. You can see the uh, crew of the submarine Russians and it was quite cold, 27th of October. So they in the winter, winter dress altogether, they did know what to do. And the Swedish Navy offered them to take submarine from the rock, which was they sitting in the bottom, in fact. So, but uh, they can pull them, but Russians uh, say no, because they were waiting for a signal from Moscow what to do. And this uh, help come much more later, 10 days they were there, sitting there. Uh, and you can see that submarine was laying in the one uh, one side. It was not straight, and the depth of was not enough in this in this area, and it was very narrow pass. So it's a Swedish uh, uh, coastal coastal uh, small ship which is coming there to investigate and make some negotiation with Russians. But uh, it was nothing happened, and I'm very pleased that it was not international scandal, which was uh, lead to the war or something. So, and then they came, Russia helped uh, uh, for the lost uh, submarine. So they came military, sh military ship from Russia and took the submarine out. And about 7th of November, when it was parade, parade big parade in the Russian square. Uh, the submarine was fortunately uh, came to, uh, I think it was in, uh, and the ship was close to the Russian base in Klaipeda. So, and uh, of course it was some uh, uh, penalty for, for, for what happened because it was a big international scandal and only in the 2006 they start to open up uh, what happened and the uh, Vasily Besedin, the political officer of the board, he uh, wrote the book about this and it was making the big film about one hour and then later I showed a little bit episode from this film and he explained what happened. And he told that uh, on the vessels it was dual navigation system which is acoustical and a radar system together. And uh, the crew was very trained and Captain Pyotr uh, Gr Gr Grushin was one of the best captain in the Russian Navy and uh, um, security officer was also good trained but they claimed that it was a mistake and then they make mistake about uh, 100 miles instead of they think that it was only 10 miles, miles mistake but it was 100 miles with a uh, miscalculation of their position. So what is this dual system? Dual system, it's a navigation system, was um, was uh, uh, consists of two things. It's a side seat uh, uh, acoustical system and a radar system, uh, radio waves. So in fact, in the background of uh, Russian device was two non-Russian device, which they combined together and make this hybrid system. They combined DECA and LORAN two systems which is not Russian, they took them uh, or bought them, I don't know, or oh, they have them and then they pull them out and then they make hybrid system. And they call in Russian, they call this pairs, this system. And when they start uh, the trip from Svina uh, uh, it's a close to Gdynia uh, in Poland, uh, they calculate uh, their pass. You can see in the map they should go to Bornholm, close to Bornholm, and make some um, turns, and then later come to uh, Russia again. Uh, so I say that it's uh, um, uh, they came to Klaipeda, should go to Klaipeda, and later to Saint Petersburg. But instead of they make the mistake, and mistake was uh, miscalculation was about. 100 miles and these 100 miles bring them to uh, water of Sweden and uh, in uh, Mysterio was that this channel was very narrow only 12 meter <laughs> uh, 
uh, uh, wide and in this uh, very narrow channel was Russian submarine, sub which as we can see together. You can see this, uh, the recording of submarines movement uh, close to this object and how uh, it was to make the mistake and then they came to Karlskrona in the naval base. So mistake, miscalculation because of uh, mistake of this dual system was calibrated uh, not enough or maybe uh, wrong. So, and so you can see again submarine and this film uh, on YouTube, on Russian, but you can see this later and I hope you enjoy this. Thank you. Now we come back to, to our lecture and you can see the film later because it's a slide, it's available for everybody. So, um, so conclusion, international collaboration and open source platforms, uh, scientific open source platforms will help us uh, to prevent such crisis. As historical documents were opened and available for public now, the role of scientific collaboration increased uh, a lot. And uh, such kind of conference, which is like Bjorn uh, together with John Papadakis established several years ago, will help us international collaboration in such question as a security. One of the last lecture of my husband was a lecture in Japan about seaside security. I think it's very important subject and uh, we should learn all together uh, from the past. Live Bjorn Students Prize, about International Live Bjorn Students Prize. Uh, students, it's our future. It's, uh, it's, they, will, uh, they will learn from mistakes which was made in the past uh, by us and by, by our colleagues. And they need to clean the mess what we did, in fact, with the, all of these devices, all of these secrets. That is why after Life Beyond the Data, I established the, uh, uh, together with John Papadakis, Life Beyond International Student Award for the Best Graduate Student Paper. And first time it was in uh, 2017, and then it was 2019. And you can see here the other yeah, and in this home page, it's about Life Bjorno, about this student's award, and uh, published the book of the uh, best students' work. You can also read this, uh, uh, these papers here. So if you would like, or you was one of the winner of the student prize, you can download this book and use this as a full publication. So, we go in the next. So, a book of students' paper was uh, published in this special site, which is devoted to Liburno and for, for the students' work. And uh, soon will be open the Live Bjorn Memorial Library, which uh, for students. And when we make also the um, competition between the best paper and one of the subjects will be seaside security, how we can do this with acoustical methods or in other methods and make our life more secure. I wish you good health and uh, good scientific uh, results. And if you student, so present your paper and maybe you will win the prize and you will, will be published, your work will be published in the year 2021. See you later, Irina Bjorna. You can download uh, slides here, just scan by mobile phone. Thank you so much, Irina Bjorna. Okay, uh, thank you, Irina, for this interesting presentation, historical information that uh, it's interesting to learn from the mistakes of the past, as you said. So now uh, we open for questions, if there is any question from our presenters or if there is any question from our participants, I uh, just recall to all the, our participants that they can submit their questions through the Imagina app just by uh, just clicking on chatting with the presenter. Uh, so, um, and our um, technical support says to us that there is no question, so I will 
want to check with the Byron if you have a question here. Okay, so I do have a question, Irina. Are you still online? Yeah. Yes, you are yeah. online. So uh, this is those uh, acoustic uh, navigation systems or called pair systems. This is you have, yeah that it's 40 years it's very long period it's a new generation new generation of uh, submarines and new gen generation of the devices of course and i was listening to your lecture and i was enjoying also to see how it's in in lab and uh, what's what's going on because uh, uh, problem of security of the sea i think in the future will be number one and uh, I can't say that what kind of system is life is not here and I'm not following the, uh, the research of the, the uh, latest devices and what's going on in Russia. But I know that in the United States Navy, devices are very, very nice and very, very clear calibrated. And you also use a lot of devices, maybe from a reason also, I see uh, sonars uh, 900 or 1200 so it's very good devices and you can see the images very clear uh, what I miss now I would like that uh, collaboration between international um, teams was established in such way that as uh, we have a Google Earth I think we should have the uh, 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 ocean ocean view on uh, in real time what's going on under the surface. That is what is missing, internationally missing. Uh, and uh, now I'm in politics. In fact, I'm uh, now the uh, deputy to the uh, Danish parliament. And uh, one of the questions what I would like to raise um, by public and by polit politician also, that we need to give money to clean the mess what's going on under the water. Because nobody would like to give money for, they give money to, to all of the things, not clean the mess. And it's start to clean the mess now in the space. And uh, I also um, uh, have the conference with astronauts, Russian astronauts and Danish astronauts. We have one Danish astronaut. And as politician, uh, we talk about how to clean the mess because mess is terrible, terrible outside and terrible under the water terrible and we need to find a way in our conference maybe next time to invite people who has the money and who has the power to establish the collaboration different teams and make their underwater map online that is what is my big challenge Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, interesting discussion. Indeed, it will be a very nice idea to have in the next um, time that this conference is into it every two years to have a session for uh, political uh, discussion as well and to invite uh, political actors in this. In this uh, yes. So you talk that what is what is now, what is state of the art now, and what we would like to have in the table. To put together like a Google or what? Okay, maybe we should invite Google from Google and under the also because they have Amazon and Google have money. Maybe we should make collaboration with them. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, thanks a lot. We are going to move to the uh, next presenter, who is uh, again Dr. Irina Giorno. She's going now to talk about uh, underwater hazardous materials mapping uh, that are the necessary steps for a secure future. So I will ask our technical support to play the video. Thank you. Hello. My name is Irina Bjorna and today I present the lecture about underwater hazardous materials mapping, UHM, uh, a necessary step for secure future. And I will talk about Baltic because I live in Denmark and the, this lecture was initiated by my husband, in fact, uh, Leib Bjorna, who died in 2000. 
2015. But he was uh, interested in a lot of subjects. And one of the subjects is the security, water side security. And we make uh, several conferences about water side security. And in, in his archives, I found some very interesting data about Baltic. And then I supplied this with the new data. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very important lecture. So just now we have the uh, stream two Russian Russian gas pipe, which is coming to um, uh, to Denmark close to Bornholm. You can see here in the map it's a Denmark, little Denmark, and uh, it's a Bornholm and close to Sweden, in fact. Uh, Latvia, Estonia, and this uh, pipe now uh, it was it should lay about uh, 100 kilometers uh, south of Bornholm. Yeah. What happens is that uh, they find out that close to Bornholm it's a lot of dangerous object because it's a, a damping of web weapons after World War II was done close to Bornholm. It was a lot of places in Baltic, but including the Bornholm. And now uh, these dangerous objects start to like mines. We talk about this later a little bit, what kind of objects, but they start to pop up because of uh, when they put the pipe down to the bottom, uh, bottom of the, uh, of the sea, it start to uh, disturb the um, sediments and a lot of things pop up. Some of the fishermen, uh, they find out that in uh, their nets, instead of fish, it was some bombs or different things. This is it's a map of uh, damping of underwater dangerous object, Hudo, underwater dangerous objects. And it was damping uh, was made in 45, 46, 47, but it was later up till uh, 61 or, or even in 65. We will talk about this also. And uh, this is uh, mustard gas, it's uh, some bombs, it's uh, some weapon. Because after the World War II, um, when Russian uh, leave the Bornholm, and it was happens in April uh, uh, 4046. Russians military decided that it's the best place to throw out dangerous uh, weapon. And you can see here in the map what is so called the risk area. A lot of risk area. And uh, it's like what I say in Latin, shades from World War II. What is, what is in the bottom of Baltic? Baltic? Underwater dangerous object. Uh, German military archives uh, uh, contain the evidence that in 45, first Nazi Germans dropped uh, 69,000 artillery shells containing nerve gas uh, near Bornholm. First it was German and then later it was Russian. So uh, now, after 75 years, rust and salt water uh, disturb uh, these materials, and now they start to poison come to the water, to the fish, to the um, plants of Baltic, uh, and it start to be dangerous. Now in Denmark, for example, pregnant women, uh, they are not allowed to eat fish more than one once per week, or it's like a if you, of course, you can eat, but it's uh, dangerous, uh, including uh, trout, very, very uh, famous uh, Bornholm sea trout, which is also a lot of poison inside and heavy metals. Soviet Union uh, buried in the Baltic in 45 after Germans, 71,000 aerial bombs with mustard gas. Uh, uh, Chloracetine bomb, uh, atomized bomb. Uh, you can see that it's about half million artillery shells with mustard gun, half million, and 30, uh, 34,000 uh, artillery shells. But it's not all. Uh, it's a 10,000 chemical smoke mines, uh, 1,004 containers 
we have 500 tons of mustard gas. Um, uh, 1,000 ton of uh, different uh, uh, substances, which is very poisoned also. Suclanid, salts, and uh, suanid. Everything in the bottom of the Baltic. You can see that it's an uh, underwater dangerous object. It's a uh, very important issue. Uh, just now we go, we go, and it's a picture from the American archives, uh, which is now this picture in American archives, uh, and uh, they can see how it was. Uh, this damping was uh, just thrown out in the water. Uh, uh, our green environment uh, movements make the uh, shell uh, make the map of uh, Baltic now with the indication what kind of uh, objects in the bottom and you can see that it's a spot spot spots uh, red yellow uh, not so much green uh, but it's a lot a lot of mess including the uh, underwater dangerous objects. Also, we make our our days also plastic, and we make a lot of things which we also throw out in the microplastic. For example, uh, fish eat microplastic, and now in the liver of the fish, a lot of microplastic, which is we consume when we eat the fish. But this is about imaging. What is in the bottom? When I say that it's a, a stream through Russian gas uh, pipeline start to uh, to be constructed close to Denmark, so it was made several images and it's acoustical imaging uh, and uh, another uh, another. Underwater dangerous objects. Also, we make our our days also plastic, and we make a lot of things which we also throw out in the microplastic. For example, uh, fish eat microplastic, and now in the liver of the fish, a lot of microplastic, which is we consume when we eat the fish. But this is about imaging. What is in the bottom? When I say that it's a, a stream through Russian gas yes, uh, pipeline start to uh, to be constructed close to Denmark, so it was made several images, and it's acoustical imaging uh, and uh, another uh, another kind of imaging, but the acoustical, the most acoustical imaging. You can see that it's an old bomb, old, old shell bomb, which is um, uh, rusty. Bed and it's about to be open. So it looks like this. Uh, till, so it's there, but it's very mild object. Of course, it's bad also for environment, but it's mild because it uh, not contains dangerous materials. And the water acoustic method are able to help us to find out and to uh, make possible to um, bottom of Baltic. We need to clean this. We, we should not think that it's somebody's uh, task. It's everybody's task. So another thing is that what I suggest that a new science and the water objectology is needed in present time where the effort of different branches of science will come, uh, will come together, including underwater acoustics, of course, to make safe underwater environment for future time. And such conferences, our conference uh, underwater acoustics can be the part of this big international community discussion about safety of underwater environment using modern technology of acoustics to monitor uh, the underwater potential dangerous object, UDO, as, as I call this. So a conclusion. The Baltic Sea is a ticking bomb right next to the uh, Nord Stream uh, 2 gas pipeline. Nearby and nearby, it's a lot of lobsters. You love lob lobsters, I love them also. And famous Bornholm trout, uh, which you may be eating together with your friends, your guests now, but think about that maybe it start to be more pollution inside the fish because of the Baltic situation. Uh, in 
2017, it was established the Life Bjorn International Student Award for the best graduate student papers. And um, we did this several times. You can see the medal uh, in the middle, medal of Life Bjorn, which is received gold, silver, and bronze medal for students because young scientists, it's the people who will help us in the future to clean this mess because they have good life, they have good knowledge, but their grandfather make the mess and we need together to think about this. So it was established um, a special uh, homepage, you can uh, just see this and download the book of abstract which is there in this page and um, I update this for 2017 and 2019 and students find the, the best papers there and maybe you will find new paper there in 2021. So, uh, and another good news, Live Bjorn Memorial Library is underway. Uh, uh, should be in Moscow, in Moscow State University. Now I'm negotiate when it will be opening, it will be also International Students Conference. I would like to make this each second year, this conference. And uh, um, I will inform everybody in the conference about this when it will be available. Now it's a negotiation, it's about 600 books which is, I have catalog, big catalog of these books. Uh, some of them very interesting from 1870. It's uh, one of the first book about the uh, acoustics and uh, wave, wave sciences. I say in such way, it's a lamp, for example. And um, what I say that, uh, thank you for your attention. I hope we can contribute together to create the safe underwater environment in Baltic. You can scan this by mobile phone and see all of the, download all of the overheads if you like. Thank you so much for your attention, Irina Bjorn. Okay, uh, thanks Irina again for this very interesting uh, presentation about underwater hazardous material mapping. I would like then to open now for questions if there's any question from our uh, presenters here. So Byron, do you have any questions? or um, our participants um, in Imagina, they can post questions by clicking on chat with the author link. I see uh, from our technical support that there are no questions from participants, uh, but I just want to quickly um, say something. Um, during this conference, Irina, I don't know if you had the opportunity to participate to the session uh, on UXO detection. I was, I was, first day I was in the uh, very interesting about the security. It was very, very good. Yeah, I think it was one of the first sessions. Yeah, because I think in the future we should uh, just make this presentation more together, I would say in such way. And I hope we can see each other because of course it's good online. But I'm sick from this already, one and a half hour online, online, I sit about uh, every day, two, three hours in Zoom and uh, Google Meet. It's very nice platform, but it's, uh, I would like to see you and discuss with the students. I would like to see everybody and uh, see uh, Michael Todorakis and uh, all of these organizers. So, but um, we can't do this, we can't do this. So. Yes, exactly. There are very interesting, uh, there were very interesting presentations in that session and uh, I think uh, if we start a network of discussions with people from TNO, from people from police here in Belgium, with us as well, the Ministry of Defence, the Navy, uh, we are working also on that because the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, we have this problem with uh, not only uh, UDO but also UXO. <coughs> I just say you because I could uh, forget about this. Uh, in the uh, beginning of September, uh, in the parliament of Danish parliament, I make the uh, Danish Russian conference about the security of Baltic Sea. And I would like to invite you there as soon as yes. it's So, because it's a, a political environment, of course, but you can make a good presentation which will be in the newspapers, online, or 
think I think we need some publicity also. Our conference is good, but it's a little bit uh, close circle. We need to be a little bit open and uh, make this more for public. Like, uh, like else. we have good, excellent results, excellent things is coming from the conference, good technology. But we need some uh, things that uh, all ordinary people understand what we are doing and say, wow, it's good so, to be flying in Mars also, but they need also to go down uh, under the water. It's so important, so important. So you are invited. <laughs> okay, that's uh, very nice. I feel really honored to for this invitation. And indeed, in this conference, there are very nice presentations, and we need to bridge the gap between uh, political decisions and uh, scientific work. Exactly. Uh, okay, thank you again for your contribution and for your presentation. Uh, if there are no more questions, I suggest we have a short break of three minutes or two minutes and a half before we start uh, with the next topic. I would just like to mention again that uh, um, questions can be still posed in the Imagina uh, app uh, and because it's going, going to be open for six months. So you, you can still, all the participants can still post some questions for the presenters. Thank you. Welcome back in our session, Mar Maritime Security. We are going now to introduce our last presenter, uh, Dr. Byron Williams. Uh, our collaborator for this work is Dr. Ali Abdullahi of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration based in the USA. Our area of research is acoustic gravity waves and surface waves arising from tsunami genic events. My thanks to Underwater Acoustics 2021 for letting me deliver this presentation on the effect of elasticity on acoustic gravity waves for a non-default rupture. First of all, I'd like to provide some motivation for our studies. In general terms, a tsunami can be regarded as a series of long wavelength waves caused by the displacement of a large volume of water, generally in ocean or large lake. They have a long history of devastation, cutting short the lives of thousands of people, causing damage to property, and posing a continuing threat to thousands of kilometers of shoreline. In the last two decades, we've seen the deadliest event so far recorded, that of Sumatra 2004, along with more recent events, such as 2011 Tohoku and 2018 Sulawesi and Powell. Given that tsunami genic events cannot yet be predicted ahead of time, present-day efforts are directed towards providing an early warning system 
this is where better understanding of acoustic gravity waves can help. Now looking at tsunami generation, in some cases, when an undersea earthquake occurs, usually along plate boundaries, the event is accompanied by a vertical uplift of the ocean floor, a rupture. This in turn elevates the water column above the rupture zone. Then under the restoring force of gravity, fast moving surface waves can propagate away from the epicenter. This is the tsunami, along with even faster moving compression type waves, which reside in the entire water column. These are the acoustic gravity waves, and they owe their existence to the slight compressibility of water. Due to their greater speed of propagation, they can easily outrun the surface waves over large enough distances. So the detection provides a means of early warning. Acoustic gravity waves can also couple to the seabed. In the solid medium, we find compression P waves and shear S waves that can propagate at S high speeds. However, the compression waves in the liquid layer are directly linked to the effective uplift of the rupture zone and therefore encode information on rupture geometry and dynamics. Past studies have modeled the rupture zone in various ways, including infinite strips, cylinders, oscillating blocks, etc., commonly with a rigid seabed. However, the shape of the rupture is usually better modeled as a rectangular block <clears throat> in order to exploit the different length scales often found in real world models. The slender fault model was first introduced in 2018 by May Kadri and then extended in our JFM paper published earlier this year. Using multiple scales analysis, the slender fault model is able to correctly predict the far field pressure. The animation shows the bottom pressure in a far field resulting from the movement of a single slender fault. The results are validated against the numerical model based on the mild slope equations and agree both on and off axis. Moving on to the surface wave, this slide shows the agreement obtained between the slender fault model and the numerical model for a point 1,000 kilometers away from the source and located on the x-axis. Again, the source is a single slender fault. The main peak of the tsunami can be captured by splitting the original slender fault into multiple parallel strips and summing their actions together by a linear superposition. Also shown for comparison is the result of using the equations derived from Stiasny's 2010 paper. Since the slender fault model is linear in nature, a macro extension is to make use of linear superposition in order to address more complicated fault arrangements, such as those found in nature. Each individual slender fault may be an upper body fault, can have its own velocity profile, orientation, dimensions, and timings. This provides a degree of flexibility in modeling more complex ruptures. In order to test the acoustic gravity wave predictions of the multi-fault model, we based our calculations on information found in the 2007 paper by Stefan Grudy. In this paper, the work of splitting up the event into different rectangular regions, along with dimensions, orientations, and timings, had already been done. This slide shows an overview of the area we considered in producing the bottom pressure map in the following slide. The origin of coordinates is at the earthquake epicenter, the yellow star. Fault centroids are shown by blue stars, and faults are delineated by rectangles. The depth below sea level is indicated by the color bar, with white areas at full kilometer depth. This video clip compares the bottom pressure map predicted by the multi-fault model in a sea of constant depth, this is the leftmost column, against the results obtained from a numerical model run with constant depth middle column and the variable depth, the rightmost column, over a time span of 60 minutes. The results of the multifold model compare favorably with the numerical results at constant depth. And even when variable depth is introduced, most of the important physics can still be captured using the model. A more detailed discussion of the missing processes, such as refraction and 
variable depth can be found in our paper. See references at the last slide. Since the DART network was not available in 2004, we could not use the Sumatra event to reliably validate the surface wave. Satellite re records are available, but these data vary in both position and time, making the comparison challenging. Instead, we chose to use the Tohoku 2011 event, where reliable data via the DART network is available. The DART boys benefit from being at fixed locations while recording their time series of surface elevations. The location of the chosen DART boy, number 21418, is shown, along with the transect connecting the epicenter to the boy. As can be seen, the slender fault model is able to capture the amplitude and timing of the main peak of the tsunami at the boy's location. Having established the validity of the slender fault model, it is desirable to extend its applicability further by adding the effects of an elastic seabed. Up to this point in the presentation, the seabed has been considered rigid. The extension is based on a 2013 paper by Eov. To achieve the merger between slender body theory and elasticity now requires three wave equations, one for the liquid layer and two for the solid. The boundary conditions also change to reflect ground movement in an elastic half space. It was found that the modal envelopes of the modified two-dimensional acoustic waves and tsunami are still governed by the Schrodinger equation. The elastic nature of the seabed induces some quite dramatic changes in the behaviour of both the surface waves and the acoustic gravity waves, arguably more so for the acoustic gravity waves. A glance at the dispersion relation for the elastic case reveals its more complicated form. The colourful plot on the right-hand side shows the phase velocity dependency on frequency for the 17 available acoustic gravity modes at a depth of 4 kilometres. Some known effects of an elastic seabed are as follows. The acoustic gravity waves in the elastic case are able to propagate into much shallower water before they penetrate into the elastic medium. In particular, the first mode is able to propagate all the way to the shore as a short wave, at which point it then becomes a rally wave. There's the possibility of a second, very long wavelength surface wave in the elastic case. This wave does not exist for every value of frequency in the elastic case and never exists in the rigid seabed case. If the elasticity of the seabed is neglected, then it's possible to find discrepancies between calculated tsunami arrival times and observed arrival times. Treating the seabed as rigid results in overestimation of the phase speed, and in the far field, the time difference can run into tens of minutes. As alluded to earlier, our ongoing work involves the merger of the slender fault model with an elastic seabed. This hybrid model will account for water compressibility, gravity and elasticity, while at the same time addressing multi-fault scenarios. The slender fault approach allows near real-time calculations, important for viable early warning systems. The results are validated numerically and against real hydrophone and dark body data. This last slide lists some of the references used in the development of the slender fault model and its merger with linear elasticity theory. So it just remains for me to thank you for listening. Thank you, Byron, uh, for this very interesting presentation here in this uh, session. Yes, indeed, we talk not only about uh, security related to human impact on the sea floor, but also natural disasters. So I'm opening now for questions. I don't know. First, I'm going to ask Irina if she has a question for Byron. If not, I'm going to check with uh, technical support says that, yeah, there are no questions in our uh, Imagine an app, but I would like to ask you something, Byron. Um, you have mentioned that, uh, yeah, your topic is um, acoustical waves prediction. 
right? Yeah. And uh, the main uh, purpose is like to estimate the, the speed at which the, the front waves are traveling to prevent, to avoid some bigger disasters or what is the main purpose of the topic? The main purpose is to, is to develop an early warning system, I guess, um, mm -hmm. using the acoustic gravity waves. As, a, as long as you're far enough away from the epicenter, uh, you have a good chance of um, you know, some, some reasonable time between detection of the acoustic waves and the arrival of the, the tsunami. So that's, that's the project, that's what we're aiming towards. Okay, all right. And the idea is like to um, to measure how, how which kind of systems are needed to put in place in order to measure uh, those kind of uh, earth um, movements that are going to provoke these tsunamis. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Hydrophones, basically. Um, there, there are a lot of hydrophones dotted around the, the ocean floor. Um, you can always use more, of course. More information is always better. Um, but yes, there's there's a lot. Um, CTBTO, I don't know if you've heard of those guys. Um, but, but they listen around the ocean floor for um, breaches of nuclear test bands. You know, so, so big explosions going off, these, these guys will pick it up. But of course, the, the same hydrophones can be used for um, earthquakes or impacting objects, any, any noise in the, in the ocean. So it's all useful data. So. All right, okay. This is not my topic at all. I'm not really involved in this kind of uh, uh, yeah, natural uh, disaster uh, prevention. Uh, so it's all new for me. So, But for instance, those hydrophones, are they located in areas um, where the, the movement of the tectonic plates are very frequent, or this is something well, that has to be done? It, it can be improved upon. There, there are some in good locations. Um, unfortunately, most of them tend to be close to the shoreline because it's easier to deploy them there, <laughs> yeah, just for purely physical reasons. Um, but yes, I know. From my point of view, I'd like to see more out in the deep ocean. Uh, you know, the, uh, it, 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 the waves travel faster in deep water, so it, it gives you a better chance, increase your time spread. You know. Yeah, it's, it's getting people to deploy these things. <laughs> yes. That's not my, yes. not my okay. reason. <laughs> okay, so but until now you are working then with the data also simulated data, but also with the real data from uh, two different tsunamis, if I understood well. Yes, that's right, yeah. There's the, Tohoku is the better documented event that we've been using. It's more recent, 2011. Um, there were dark boys and hydrophones, so that's, that's better. 2004 has gone further back, so the, um, you know, there's less data available than that. But going forward, hopefully the data will improve, and. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, thanks a lot then uh, for this interesting uh, discussion. And okay. if uh, you or Irina have uh, something else to mention, please uh, do it now. Olga, yeah, I, will, I would like to ask about uh, uh, this warning system. Yeah, what is uh -huh. the what is what is they told that it will be improved warning system yeah for tsunami uh, what is sorry it's a base or what so, sorry can you say again i didn't catch that uh, uh, uh fact is uh, in fact that you would like to improve their warning system yes system what is the improvement it's about the you uh, improve for Two hours, Ellie, for one day, Ellie, what is what is your prediction for tsunami? Um, as long as we sort of an hour, an hour, something like that, um, that sort of time. What is their modern system now? What is their warning time? Uh, you have the dark boys are mainly the more, that the warning system used at the moment, as well as the seismic events, of course. Um, you know, you have information from the from seismometers. But uh, at the moment, the, the dark boy network is the main um, source of warnings. 
but the trouble with that, you have to wait for the tsunami wave to actually pass the boy. So I guess yeah. it's almost too late at that point, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, if, if you can use the acoustic waves, these travel seven, eight times faster than the tsunami itself. So if you can detect those in the far field early enough, it, it gives you an increased um, early warning. Uh, uh, because I was, I was um, uh, the evident of the tsunami in Hawaii once. Oh, okay. I'd like to see one. I'd like to see one, but from a safe distance. <laughs> there, and uh, it was a warning system about uh, two hours before before event start, fact and uh, it was enough time to evacuate all of the conference, and then we were moved to the uh, to the city uh, because two hours it's a long time. It's good time, in fact, yeah. And then yeah. it comes uh, five centimeter tsunami because <laughs> it, yeah, 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 but it cost a lot of money for evacuation and system. But I can see it's working. It's working. Yes, I think if I remember right, Hawaii is more or less in the middle of the Pacific. So you've got the, the, the tectonic plates in a ring around it. So if everything is going to take some time to reach Hawaii. So they're sort of in a good position. Like, <laughs> it's, it's not so good for people on the edge. <laughs> it was a mathematical conference about the modeling of the different processes, including acoustical, but not only acoustical, it's modeling, uh, uh, mathematical modeling. So uh, the scientific conference, it was working in one of the subjects was the uh, uh, this subject of the what how we can predict such event, yeah? And th this event happened in that time. So it was very nice that correlate, correlation was very, very nice. So I think it's very important that you, you should uh, carry on and uh, uh, maybe it should be a combination of two methods, acoustical and uh, seismic, seismic methods. Yes, yeah, I say that in our, in our time, we can't only make the one pass and say that acoustical is the best or uh, seismic is the best method. We need to combine uh, different signs together. Yes. together. And what also I a little bit uh, and it was in the uh, first or second conference it was a lot of people from the uh, branches close to acoustic for example it was people from the uh, animal sorry sorry to interrupt <laughs> the discussion but we need to close the session because our technical support has to move to the next session so we can continue this discussion by chat if you want. Um, I would like to thank all the participants and all the presenters here for the interesting topics today. And yeah, continue enjoying then the conference today. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Bye.